So the next phrase of our big prayer is, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But I want to begin this morning carrying immediately from where we ended up last week. Um, this sermon series could be a little bit like the Lord of the Rings. The story is the three movies of Lord of the Rings were filmed as one monster movie and then he edited it out. This is one sermon that started a couple of weeks ago and will continue for a number of weeks so I am picking up where we left off, or I'm picking up a theme that we tripped over, tripped over last week. There was so much more I wanted to say about our Father that I just, I, I simply couldn't. But I want us to begin our contemplation of thy kingdom come with Jesus' relationship to his Father, our Father. I asked us to look at Isaiah chapter 6, 1 to 8. And I, I debated with myself about this, but let's reread most of that section, or let me reread most of that section. Isaiah chapter 6, um, I'm just going to read 2 to, to 8, but chapter 1 says, Isaiah, when the, the year King Uzziah died, a very specific moment in history, so it places him very clearly in history. He had a vision of God, and what he saw was God on the throne, and above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, we sang it, Holy, 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 well, almost. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the sound of the voices, the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, for I am ruined. That word could also mean disintegrated. I have come apart. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst people, a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, and with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar, and with it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell his people, Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. But go and tell his people, dot, dot, dot. God, the Holy One, sent Isaiah. Sent Isaiah with a message. But I really want to, to, to recognize that God sent Isaiah. God sent Jesus. Jesus sends us. When we pray, God our Father who art in heaven. We think of these implications. The Father, God in Isaiah, the Holy One sent Isaiah. God sent Jesus. And what does Jesus say in John chapter 20, verse 21? Peace be with you. Stop right there. In this age of anxiety, what do we long for? I listened to a sermon driving in this morning on hope, but perhaps even be, be for or an implication or a close cousin of hope is peace. Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. God sent Isaiah with a message. Jesus sends us with a message. And the core of that message is thy kingdom 
come. Remember what we were looking at in Ephesians a little while ago, that we are to live a life worthy of our calling. This is our calling. We are called to live the message of Jesus. And we are to live a life. Not just believe a belief. Believe a belief system. We are to live a life. We are to be my witnesses, Jesus says, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, in Mimico, in Etobicoke, in Toronto, in Canada. Before we look at the kingdom message, a word about words. Heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. I guess we're starting at the end and working to the beginning. Heaven is not a place. It's, it's, it's easy for us and common for us, but it's sort of a colloquialism that isn't at all accurate that we say up there. Heaven is where God is. It's God's realm. It's God's presence. Earth, therefore, I guess not then necessarily therefore, but earth is God's created, where we live. Heaven is beyond time and space. Where we live, we suffer with the limitations of the laws of science. We live in time. We live in space. We live with flesh and bones. We live with stubbed toes and hair loss. God's realm is beyond all of that. Where God is, there is heaven. Footnote or bracket to this. Therefore, what hell is, the best definition that I can think of is what God is, hell is not. God is love, there is no love. God is light, there is no light. God is peace, there is no peace. God is mercy, God is just. All of these things, the reverse is what hell describes. But I think we know this. I think we understand that fundamentally, that heaven is God's realm. Earth is our realm. Earth is the created of, or God's created space. So when we talk about God's kingdom, we are not talking about a geopolitical piece of land divided by boundaries. The kingdom of God is where God reigns. Imagine a society, a culture, a community that actually operated on the principles that God has and teaches us. Actually operated on love, on compassion, on grace, on justice actually functioned. That's the kingdom of God where those things function. Two quick illustrations on how we do this pragmatically today, tomorrow. Two quick illustrations. I go back to when I was probably 12 or 13. My dad was a preacher, a minister in northern Ontario, and I was helping him one day do something in the back of the church, uh, in the yard of the back of the church. I think it was repairing the back steps, but I don't know. I don't remember. It doesn't matter. The neighbor leaned over the fence and, and said, Hey, pastor, what are you doing? And dad walked over there and described to him what he was doing, but made it sound like my dad didn't know what he was doing and asked the neighbor for advice and input and, and contribution to the task. And so he and the neighbor chatted for a while and wandered off. My dad came back to me, and I was very confused. I said, Dad, you knew exactly how to do what you did. Why did you ask for advice? And it was a genuine question, and he gave me a fatherly kind of smile and said, I wanted him involved. I wanted him to know he could talk to me. I wanted to be a neighbor. That has obviously has stayed with me. I don't remember the details, but I remember that conversation. And I remember my dad being... A good neighbor. I was loaned this book 
and I've got to return it. I was loaned this book a while ago and, in fact, just finished it this week. And a really interesting story of, it's called My Vertical Neighborhood, living in a high-rise and honestly saying, how can we be neighbors? I'm not, I don't remember... Somebody has argued this point with me a minute ago. I don't remember the book saying we're going to be the kingdom of God in our building, but I do remember the characters, the real people in the story saying, how can we be a good neighbor? And so they set up meal times and other times in the common area of the apartment complex simply to be neighbors and neighborly. And the group of people that gathered and grew amongst these two women were a motley crew. The authors, at the, towards the end of the book, the author describes her best friend out of that group was this, I hesitate to describe him here, but was a gay man, very involved in the world, very interested but not quite convinced by the author's, by Linda's story. But I think, now I'm reading between the lines, she might have been surprised by the person who she was closest to amongst that group was not what she might have expected. But maybe it was the person who Jesus would have spent most time with. These are examples of being kingdom people in communities where they lived. My dad was a kingdom person in that community, and I'm so far off my notes. Can you imagine a society and a culture if God's character reigned here? God's justice, God's love, God's mercy, God's grace. Are you ready for this? This has eschatological implications. I went to seminary. I know lots of big words. Basically, it's the end times. What does the end look like? That's the study of eschatology. Uh, the study of end times, eschatology. Um, and there are lots of views on this. But in the end, God's kingdom will reign on earth. The Lord's Prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's kingdom is a real, is a physical kingdom on earth. The last chapter, no, second to last chapter of the Bible, we read in Revelation then I saw, this is John writing about a vision, heaven, a new heaven and a new, a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There is no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a sound of the voice of the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now amongst us, amongst the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, nor mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. What I want us to notice here is that God's kingdom, God's reign, the end times is God coming down to earth to be with us. Yes, it's a new earth. Yes, it's a new heaven. I don't understand exactly what that means. But it's not that we get to, our hope is not to escape this world. Our hope is in God to transform this world so God can be in this world within and through us. Footnote number two, I know that there are lots of different views about the end times and what that looks like, um, but the older I get, the less I am convinced, the less that it doesn't ring true that our hope is to be rescued from this earth. 
Our call and our hope is to transform this earth, our communities. What, do we, what are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be in a community of Christ, sharing Christ with our communities. We are bringing the kingdom of God into our town. We are being kingdom of God people to our neighbors. Before again, before we look at the content of kingdom, a word about the will of God. I've often prayed this prayer with a shrug of passivity. God, if you're sovereign, if your will will be done, what do I have to pray for? What do I have to do? It's going to happen anyway. If you are sovereign, why bother? But we've already prayed, have we not, our Father. When we think of Father, we think of sending and being sent. God the Father sent Jesus. Jesus sends us on a mission on, with a message. We cannot be passive about obeying the mission and the message. Even if God is sovereign, which he is, we are still responsible for the mission and the message. I often say our relationship with God is an adult relationship where we both have responsibilities and things to do. I've said this a number of times in the past, that our relationship with Jesus is, in a sense, an apprenticeship relationship. How did Jesus act and live is how we should act and live. How did Jesus act and live? So often in the Gospels we read phrases like, I do the will of the Father. Or it is the will of the Father. Or as the Father, so I. We have this relationship between Jesus and his Father. And this culminates in Jesus' prayer to the Father. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, the disciples. He knelt down and he prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Jesus was a human being. He didn't want to go to the cross, humanly speaking. But he knew it was his mission, his calling, and his will. He gave over his will to the will of the Father. I mentioned John 17 earlier, and I reread it recently, and I was amazed how often or how much of that prayer is Jesus giving the will of God the Father and what God's will for his people, for us, is to be. It is really much a prayer of God's will for his followers, for us. See, if we emulate if we apprentice Jesus' relationship with a father, we can't have a passive attitude about the will of God, about the sovereignty of God. It is something we must do. Okay, I have put off a couple of times looking at what the content is of thy kingdom, but, yep, we're going to have to do this really, really quickly. Jesus expressed his mission with very little comment. Luke, uh-oh, am I pushing the wrong button? Luke chapter 4, 16 to 21. Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went to the synagogue. As was his custom, he stood up and he read of the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling, he found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery for the sight of the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today, the scripture, sorry, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Both the message and the mission is captured in these verses. It is good news. What does gospel mean? Gospel means good news. It is 
Good news to the poor. Freedom for the prisoners. Footnote number 17. When I read prisoners in today's context, I often will read addicted. One of the saddest persons people I know is a niece who is hopelessly addicted to opioids. She's a mess. I say hopelessly, human, humanistically speaking, but we pray for her, and we pray that her biological father, who is an addictions recovery counselor, can break through. It is good news. It is healing for physical, spiritual, emotional, and relational ills. It is justice to the oppressed and the marginalized. We don't have time this morning, but compare this, these two, three verses with Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 and following. Jesus tells a parable about the sheep and the goats. Who will be in the presence of God and who will not be are those who cared for the least of these, who gave water to the thirsty, clothes to the naked, hey, visit the sick and the prisoner. Living in the kingdom means living differently. One of the biggest books on my shelf, 500 or so pages, is called Kingdom Ethics. How to Live Christianly. It's sometimes it's called the upside-down kingdom. Instead of privilege, service. Instead of hate, agape. Instead of revenge, we pray for our enemies. If we listen to the noise coming through social media today, and I'm so tired of my news feed, I'm tired of Trump, Trudeau, and Taylor, but if we listen carefully, we see an opportunity. Because what is the language? The language is freedom. The language is justice for the impressed, for the marginalized people. It is for health. It is for justice. I believe our evangelistic strategy today is to figure out a way to convince these voices that true Christianity is the best chance for exactly what people are calling for. Where do we get our identity? This world is identity politic. Our identity is in Christ. If we can figure out a way to get them to seriously, I say them, yes, but get them to seriously consider what the true tenets of the gospel is. It could move them into faith in Christ and being mission bearers, being evangelists in the proper way. I want to end this morning with an observation. Again, an observation that I've been tripping over a little bit over the last weeks of the disciples watching Jesus and learning to act like Jesus. As we are kingdom livers, we need to act like Jesus act. In the Luke passage of the Lord's Prayer, there's an interesting introduction that's not in the Matthew passage. So in Luke it says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come. Now, it is an abbreviated version of the Lord's Prayer because the point that Luke was trying to make was the disciples wanted to behave and act like Jesus. Again, when I talk about discipleship and apprenticeship, we need to learn to live and act like Jesus. We see Jesus praying We should be praying. We see Jesus stepping away from busy ministry to rest. I was going to say relax. That's probably not accurate, but certainly rest and recharge. We should do that too. We see Jesus lifting up bleeding women, sinful women. He touched leprous men. He hung out with tax collectors. That's what we should be doing. We are called and committed to ushering the kingdom of God on earth in Mimico as it is in heaven. So again, just practice. What does kingdom mean in your life, in your world? What does your will be done in your life, in your world? How do we change this earth so it become like 
heaven. And read Luke 4, 16 to 21. What was Jesus' mission? Read again Matthew 25, 31. Understand what kingdom of God should look like. And end your prayer with a very dangerous prayer because it's always answered. Lord, give me an opportunity today, this week, to share with my neighbor something of, let me just say, something of substance.